So today we are going to talk about the, the deadly sin of lust. And as I was trying to prepare and study, in the New Testament, where we find this word repeated more and more, it's in the original language, I didn't want to say this, but allow me to say this so that you may know that I prepared. The, 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 the word there, the word there, the, the, the original word actually is epithumeo. You know, I tried to rehearse it and it's not coming out. Ep, you know, epithumeo, you know. And this is a compound word actually that means epi in, you know, and thumeo concerning the mind, concerning the heart, or concerning the mind. And what it means literally is that, you know, that lust is a chain reaction of uncontrolled desires that starts from the mind. That starts from the mind. Last is when we misuse someone actually for our own benefit. No love. You know, just misuse someone for our own benefit, for our own gain. And so today, um, divided perhaps the someone in three ways, we are going to talk about the character of lust. Then we are going to talk about the cost of lust. And then finally, we'll see the cure for lust. So character, cost, and cure. And we'll read this from the book of Proverbs. So if you may, please turn with me to the book of Proverbs, chapter 7. That's where we are going to camp today. But also we get another story from the book of 2 Samuel. If you turn there, Proverbs, chapter, uh, chapter 7. Verse 1, it says, My son, keep my words and store up my commands within you. Keep my commands and you will live. Guard my teachings as the apple of your eyes. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister and call understanding your kinsman. They will keep you from the adulteress, from the wayward wife with her seductive words. And so we'll look at that later because that's a summary of what we are going to discuss today. But allow me to start from verse 6, you know, and then we check what the Bible tells us. Verse 6 says to 9, At the window of my house, I looked out through the lattice. So this is the wisdom or the, the, you know, this is the view of the father. So the father is telling this young guy, I looked out through the lattice. And there I saw among, I saw among the simple, I noticed among the young men, a youth who lacked judgment. And he was going down the street near her corner, walking along in the direction of her house at twilight, as the day was fading, as the dark of the night sets in. And so you can tell the stage is set. You get the lights are dim, you know, and this guy, this young man now, leaves the fold of the father and the community and start walking alone. And last many times, comes to us when we are alone and when you are very vulnerable. The young man leaves the safe net of his community. It's evening. And this is the time that actually he should be resting from the hard day's work, right? But he opts to change the course of his direction. Instead of resting from the day's hard work, he heads to the red district and assuming. So it is evening and he thinks that the veil of the dark night will kind of like cover him as he leads himself into temptation. But we know that he isn't covered from the view of his father. Much as we are because God also is our father and he sees every action and every intention. So he thinks that he's veiled, it's dark, no one is seeing, and rightly so. But he doesn't know actually that he's being seen, he's being located that God actually has the GPS location of where he's going and what he's doing. And even for us, many times, lust lies to us that no one else knows. Sometimes when you lock that door, or we find ourselves so vulnerable, we think that we are shielded from the community, from the eyes of everybody. But friends, let us remember that God sees and God is aware of our every moment. Verse 10 to 12 says, Then out came a woman to meet him. So when you are vulnerable, you know, dressed like a prostitute with a crafty intent, 
She is loud and defiant. Her feet never stay at home. Now in the street, now in the squares, at every corner she lacks. And so if you thought that actually last is a problem of men, we are introduced to a woman here, you know, who the Bible says she's not actually a prostitute. She has dressed like one. She is a wife. And that's the difference. Commercial sex workers' intention is just to offer their bodies for money. But this one is different. He has a craft, she has a crafty intent. And so, please remember, as we read this, please remember that and underline that. She has a crafty intent. She's dressed perhaps in a revealing, you know, short dress. You know, it's very short that the month of Feb, you know, very short. <laughs> and the young man sees every part of her body. And I, please, I don't want to paint or to, for you to struggle with this imagination. I'm just <laughs> discussing what the scripture is saying, right? All right, this is what the Bible is saying here. So do not go back home trying to... How was she dressed, actually? And so the young man sees every part of her body. And he thinks, this young man thinks, that she has nothing to hide, for, she, for he can see every part of her body. But inwardly, the Bible says that she had a crafty intent. The main agenda is bigger than she can see. And she's ready to give her body so as to conceal her intentions. And the young man is unaware of such. Her loud and rebellious character leads her to seek love outside home. And it's a trap of many men who, you know, many men, you know, sometimes we want a Kim Kardashian who is saved. You know, she bold, you know, and all, but, but loves, but kind of loves the Lord, right? And we prefer that more than modesty, perhaps. But let's continue our story. At every corner, she lacks. She's hunting for a younger man, and she's looking for an opportunity. And this is the metaphor that we have from this story. In verse 13, it says, she took hold of him, and kissed him, and with a brazen face, she said, and, I mean, get me there. The idea here is that finally she has gotten hold of him. And she offered herself pretty fast. The guy is just confused. You know, just before he comes to his senses, because he comes to church, he's a real group leader. You know, he's, a, he's, he's where? You know, just before he, he's kissed and he's confused, and the guy lost his, loses his senses. And just again before he thinks, before he thinks, you know, I'm saved, you know, I'm, you know, I'm in, you know, what, 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 what? He says, this girl says in verse 14, please read with me. I have fellowship offerings at home. Today I have fulfilled my vows. Don't you like that? She seduces the young man with, re with religion. I am a worshiper like you. You get? Serious. She has noticed that this man has come from the safe fold of his father. She has trailed him. She knows his language. But she's a hypocrite who comes with religion to seduce. And the young man is not aware of the trap. Verse 15. After that, she, she says, so I came out to meet you. I looked for you and I have found you. Don't you like that? Imagine. A Kim Kardashian who is saved telling you, I have looked for you. <laughs> what would you do as a young guy? What is there left, right? <laughs> I came out to meet you. I looked for you and have found you. Friends, in matters of lust, lust drives especially with flattery comments and compliments that, you know, th that are malicious, but you, are, you may not be aware of them. And this is one of the many lies used by the sinful nature to promote selfish agenda. But God is, has written this word, has given us this word, so that we may, be, we may be alert to flattery, so that we are not be, they are deceived by it. And this is why I normally encourage my brothers, please be cautious about the comments that you make. The compliments that you give, especially to the opposite gender. Are they true? Are they pure? Or you're just saying that so that you may trap the person. 
Flattery is often coupled with lying. As a flatterer is not concerned with whether or not he or she is being truthful, but is concerned about something else. So my dear sisters, be aware of flattery language. And men also, if you are in any position of influence, any position of influence, be aware of what I would call flatterers, so to speak. Because unlike us men, women are not attracted sexually, but for influence, to influence. If anyone has any sense of power, has done something major, you know, it is that which attracts the, the ladies. And this girl actually uses seductive, flattery language, and she promises him that all she has is his. I looked for you, and I have found you. You are all I wanted. Verse 16. I have covered my bed. You know, other versions you have there, you say couch. With colored linens from Egypt. I have perfumed, perfumed my bed with ma, owls, and cinnamon. Hey. <laughs> wow. Hata kama you are a brother, we are you know, Egypt. <laughs> Carpet. Hello, cinnamon. Wow. And these are the things you have just come from your father's home. You know nothing about spices, <laughs> about perfume, right? And his sense of smell and touch is aroused. Sight, smell, and sound. Everything is said. She offered an atmosphere that looked so pleasing, valuable, delightful, and special. It is not how I wish this man would have known that actually there is nothing in the couch. Actually, the couch is just but a coffin. And the bed is perfumed not for pleasures, but for pain. The young man would have quickly known that ma and aloes and cinnamon were actually mixed to anoint the dead bodies. You may remember Jesus was being, you know, someone went there to anoint the dead body of Jesus with this, with ma and all these things. She's not anointing you so that you may live long. Actually, so that you may die. Relationships may die, right? All these, all dreams may die. And actually, the purpose and the will that God has for you, all that may die. But the guy is confused and blinded and thinks that I want to smell nice. It's gonna be a good night. The scene of last, friends, if you are not careful, it's like a house in a funeral procession. It only leads us to the burial site of our dreams, of the plans that God has for us, and we have to be extremely careful about that. Let us see what happens. Then verse 18 says, Come, let us drink deep of love till morning. Let us enjoy ourselves with love. Friends, last of our promises, exaggerates. Anyone who is married here, Know that this is a lie. You get? Right? Till morning. This is, this is 6, 6 p.m., brothers. 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Let's enjoy ourselves with love till morning. It's a lie, right? Nothing like that. And the guy thinks, now I am a five CD changer. Pa -pa -pa -pa. Only to get married there and realize that he is a disc man. <laughs> if you know, you know. And, <laughs> and just in case, friends, and just in case the man's conscience is awakened, just in case the guy is still thinking about retracting, about not taking this deal, just before his conscience is awakened, she throws in a deal there. My husband isn't at home. Verse 19, my husband is not at home. 
He has gone on a long journey. And he took his purse filled with money and will not be at home till full moon. One month. One month. He offers for a full night of pleasure that we know that will only end in premium tears. This comes with a promise. You know, a long time ago, you know, some years back when, you know, we were growing up, we used to fear, you know, getting into this, um, you know, in, into, into lust because we used to be told, you know, that we, were, we, we feared infection, right? We feared infection. We feared conception, you know, so you feared you get AIDS, you might have a child out of wedlock, uh, conception. But nowadays, we have dealt with those two, right? Now, the one that we fear most is detection. You get? So we fear being detected. That's why many of you, brothers and sisters, this phone is one of your most guarded property in the whole world. You will not give anything to this one. All right? It has fingerprints lock. You know, it has a password, one, two, three, four. You know, it has, what, pattern that is like the Milky Way, the way you do it. You know, no one will ever get hold of it. This kind of thing here, this kind of gadget, because we do not want to be detected. And people are living like strangers at home. And this thing is putting that, uh, that, that wedge between a marriage, a family, because you have kept all your secrets in here. No one will get hold of that. So this girl promises secrecy. No one will know. Ours will be a discreet one. What happens in Vegas will remain in Vegas. And then says there will be no consequences. My husband is away. We won't be discovered. And that's why I encourage couples, please limit your time that you're away from each other. But even once, it's not the time that you're away disconnected physically. It's when you're disconnected emotionally. I think that's the hardest because many people are living together in the same room, but with separate words there, struggling with, uh, with separate words. So I encourage you, please get into that time of communication and co conversations well so that you may be together in this life. Anyway, let's continue with our story there. We are now in verse 20. 21. With persuasive words, she led him astray. She seduced him with her smooth talk. And do you know what happens? Verse 22. All at once he followed her. I mean, there's no way. Because lust is so persevering. It puts pressure and pressure and pressure. You lose your focus. It fogs the way you make decisions. And after that, the, guys, the guy just all at once, he followed her. But do you know like what? Like an ox going to the slaughter. Like a deer stepping into a noose. I don't know if there is anyone who can be able to overcome such a tempter. With persuasive words, she led him astray. And she seduced him with her smooth talk. At once, he followed her smooth talk. All at once, he followed her like an ox going for slaughter. Like a deer stepping into a noose. You can't run from such. You find that you get a muscle pull. When you try to run out of that, you get a muscle pull. It's finished. Verse 23 says, Till an arrow pierces his liver, like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing it will cost him his life. It started well. It ends badly. Then he says there, Now then, my sons, listen to me. Pay attention to what I say. Do not let your heart turn to her ways or stray into her paths. Many are the victims she has brought down. So initially she had said that you are the only one, right? But the Bible says here, many are the victims she has brought down. Her slain are a mighty throne. Her house is a highway to the grave, leading down to the chambers of death. It doesn't end well. The pleasure that was promised there all that you have at the end is pain. The return on investment is negative, actually. 
friends, lust may manifest itself in marital unfaithfulness, premarital sex, or pornography, and you may think that lust doesn't have a victim. That there is no, that though, that there is no smoking gun. There is no circumstantial evidence. But we know that lust leads to death of dreams, purpose, relationships, and dignity will be destroyed by lust. Masturbation practices is nowadays celebrated casually in the media. You know, someone once told me that they are in the business of selling, you know, sex toys. You know that that's a booming business. I'm not saying that you go there. You are our sheep. You are our people here. Please do not indulge yourself in that business. And it looks as a harmless activity with no spiritual, emotional, or physical side effects, but just a thrill of the moment. But we know where it goes. Friends, pornography isn't a victimless crime. It kills the soul. It steals your heart and destroys your mind from making a rational decision. And in its subtle ways, it has creeped even to our homes today. Through music, what is it that our children are watching? And friends, we are handing over our children to the devil at an early age. The things that they are seeing on the screens. And someone last week commented, on helping you to prepare, said that, that the preteen of this age is watching or has experienced explicit materials more than King Solomon with his 1,000 wives ever experienced. And these are 10-year-old, 11 years old. What is it that we are feeding them? Let us look at another the place. The, I mean, we are cutting up, we're talking about the cost of lust. Let us see the cost of lust quickly in another story. Please just turn back to the book of to the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 13. And this is a sad story. Because sometimes we do not see or we do not know the cost of lust. And we need to be aware of it so that we can be ready and we can be instructed to be ready and to run away from it. And this is a sad story. And I want to put here a lot of pastoral sensitivity because I know that some, most likely, maybe this could have been their experience. The Bible says in the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 13, that in the course of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. And from the onset, this tells you there's, there's something here that even shouldn't happen. Amnon, this is his uh, half-sister called Tamar. Verse 2 says, Amnon became frustrated to the point of illness on account of his sister Tamar. For she was a virgin and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. Now Amnon had a friend called Jonadab. You know, and Jonadab, son of Shimea, David's brother. So all this is happening actually at home. Jonadab was a very shrewd man. He asked Amnon, why do you, the king's son, look so haggard morning after morning? Won't you tell me? Amnon said to him, I am in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. See what lust does. He can't say that I'm in love with my sister Tamar. It's my brother's sister. Because he wants to perhaps to appease his consciousness that this is what I want to do. And so she's distant and to validate his act. Amnon said, sorry, verse 5 says, go to bed and pretend to be ill, Jonadab said. When your father comes to see you, say to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare the food in my sight so that I may watch her and then eat it from her hand. This is the plan that Jonadab has. And Jonadab, I mean Amnon takes the advice. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. When the king came to see him, Amnon said to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and make some special bread in my sight so that I may eat from her hand. 
David, the father, unaware, verse 7 says, sent word to Tamar at the, play, at the palace, go to the house of your brother Amnon and prepare some food for him. So Tamar, innocently, went to the house of her brother Amnon, who was lying down. She took some dough, kneaded it, made the bread in his sight, and baked it. Then she took the pan and served him the bread, but he refused to eat. Just innocently, the girl is doing what she has come to do to her brother. But verse 11 says there, sorry, let me read it from verse, from verse 9. Send everyone out of here, Amnon said. So everyone left him. Then Amnon said to Tamar, bring the food here into my bedroom so that I may eat from your hand. And Tamar, this is a brother, and Tamar took the bread she had prepared and brought it to her brother Amnon in his bedroom. Unaware of the schemes. But when she took it to him to eat, he grabbed her and said, come to bed with me, my sister. Now he says sister there, but even saying that the sister, his conscience is so seared, he can't even think. He can't make a rational decision. And last is that inner preoccupation with your own desire that you can't see the good of the other person. You only see how your needs can be met. And so after that, the Bible says, verse 12, don't, my brother, she said to him, don't force me. And here, allow me to make a comment here. Verse 11, sorry. Come to bed. You know, but when she took it to him to eat, he grabbed her and said, come to bed with me, my sister. Actually, let me follow it up down there. Don't, my brother, she said to him, don't force me. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. So Tamar knows the boundaries, the sexual boundaries that she should have. Don't do this wicked thing. What about me? Where could I get rid of my disgrace? And what about you? So Tamar even cares for her brother. She loves her brother, cares about him, and says, and what about you? You would be like one of the wicked fools in Israel. Please speak to the king. He will not keep me from being married to you. And I don't think here Tamar was offering herself. I think she was just trying to um, create a ploy on how she can escape from this trap that she's in. He will not keep me from being married to you. But he refused to listen to her, and since he was stronger than she, he raped her. Such a sad story there. He was stronger than she. And I know that this is the experience of many. Some in this country know that they have to, you know, they have to give themselves, especially the ladies, because someone else is stronger, is in a position of authority and misuses his authority, you know, to get what he wants. When we were in college, we could hear that there were uh, sex transmitted grades because the lecturer, you know, you want to finish this and some people will be kept hold there for two, three years. But so that I may get my papers, let me give myself there because someone is stronger. Do you use your power in any way that misuses the other people who are lower than you? Since he was stronger, he did this act. Verse 15, then after the act, Amnon hated her with intense hatred. And I hate this word here, intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. Amnon said to her, get up and get out. Mission accomplished. Last, we not only kill you, but we kill the dreams of others, friends. And so this girl dies probably without children or even at an early age. And the one who was supposed to be fruitful because of the last of a man, you know, dies a desolate woman. I wanted to put these two stories parallel so that you see the, how last actually affect and the end goal of last. And so at the end, our, our, you know, the, the young man in Proverbs, you know, dies, but also now because of the last of the man and this atrocious activity that happened to her because of a man, you know, she dies a desolate woman, maybe without children, or even at an early age. Friends, be aware of sins that look like pleasant sins. They easily gain the heart and close it from within. Then it says there, when King David heard all this, verse 21, he was furious, 
Absalom never said a word to Amnon, either good or bad. He hated Amnon because he had disgraced his sister Tamar. And after that, actually, the next passage there from verse 23, Absalom, after two years, plants and killed Amnon. And the family is in disarray because something bad has happened. And I like Tamar because she didn't hide it. She didn't keep it to herself. Friends, in matters of last, what's the cure? Quickly, what's the cure? We have looked at the first, how last, the character of last. We have looked at the cost that at the end it leads to death of dreams, of hopes, of aspirations. Now, what's the cure? Let's go back to our passage or in Proverbs chapter 7. Just has come to an end. What's the cure? The cure here is to, number one, to hide God's word in your, in, in, your, in your heart and to protect God's word. It says there, my son, keep my words and store up my commands within you. Keep my commands and you will live. Guard my teachings as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. And this here, I think it indicates memorizing scriptures so that when that time comes, when the evil time comes, you may know how to stand at the book of Ephesians chapter 6 tells us that our walk with God if we pursue God's word, he will make us put to death our lustful passions. Because it is impossible to walk with God when we do not want to starve our sins to death, the last. But if we read God's word, then the God's word is going to help us to attack lustful passions. You may remember when Joseph was tempted by Potiphar's wife. He said that, now how can I do such a bad thing? How can I sin against my God? Friends, let God's word stir us to hate this sin and give us a way out. It says there, guard my teachings as the apple of your eyes. And the apple of your eyes is just the pupil, you know, the black thing. You know, the Hebrew thought that it looks like an apple. That, that's simply it. You know, there is you know, nothing much. But see the image of the eye here. One of the most protected organs or body parts actually in the body is the eyes, right? One, because the eyes are a bit inside, you get, so that they can be protected by the skull. The cheeks somehow, you know, it has the, 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 the eyelids to protect it. And when bad things get into it, into the eye, what do you do? It tears, it wants to clean itself. It has a self-cleansing mechanism to make sure that there is no impurity in it. It is one, even the brain is not as guarded as the eyes. When you see something bad, what do you do? You close your eyes. You do not want to see it. And that's what God is saying here. That we need to protect the word of God in our hearts like the apple of our eyes. We hide it in our hearts and protect. One, because lust is a leech, as we have seen, that will drain you dry. It separates you from God and it bleeds you to death, and unlike perhaps the other sins, it dies with others. So, do friends, do not cuddle it. Do not hesitate to put it down. This means ditching the things that, you know, are making you perhaps feast on lust. Because behind your sins, back, is a knife that is meant for your heart. That's what it says. Till an arrow pierces his liver. So do not hesitate to put it to death, friends. This means forsaking some things that are making you fail. What are the movies that you are watching? Relinquishing some of the privileges that you have. Cutting ties with friends who are making it harder for you to forsake this sin. And you run to Jesus with your life. For your soul and your life and others. Be relentless in fighting this sin, whether you're a woman or a man. And God designed last to be controlled from the inside. Hide the word of God in your heart. So we must be spirit-led. And, and, and control our imaginations so that these things don't have access to our souls. Secondly, apart from hiding God's word in your heart, secondly, is be a good steward. 
You need to be a good steward of the resources that God gives you, whether it is of time or money. Be a good steward of that. And finally, and finally, remember that last, and hopefully this will motivate you, that last is an, uh, is an affront to God's image. Human beings are created in the image of God. The book of Genesis says that. In the image of God, he created them both, male and female. That they were created in the image of God. And so only do to people those things that God wants to do to them. Extend love to them. Extend to them godly uh, compliments. The Bible says that, you know, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. It compliments us. Then what do we need to do? Could you be struggling in this? Last drives in secrecy, as we have seen. Be accountable to God. Be accountable to others. God doesn't heal that which is covered. We have to uncover it, and then God will heal it. Last loses its power when we find ourselves in a good environment where there is accountability. I pray that you remember the words of Paul in the book of Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, then be thinking about such things.